Hey everybody, Jared Jones. Florida was raging in 2022 as it was the highest migrated to state in all the United States. The South, by and large, took in more movers, people coming from other areas of the country into those states, outdoing all the other areas, the West, the Midwest, the Northeast, all fell flat by comparison. So with that being said, what is in store for Florida in 2023? Are all these movers coming into the state needing a place to live going to be enough to keep prices buoyed into the new year or is there going to be some serious price shifting such as we're seeing throughout the country today i'm going to take you through orlando some of the other major markets like miami jacksonville we're going to look at some of the hot spots some of the dangerous spots some of the areas that i think are doing great in 2022 some of the areas that I think are going to show great promise in 2023 and some of the ones that if you own in those areas, you probably might want to consider selling it now. Let's get started. So the breaking news is that the South actually dominated in where Americans moved in the year 2022. You can see from Florida, Florida and Texas, particularly the largest numbers taken in 319,000, 231,000 in Texas. You had Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, all of those. And as a result, you'd see a breakdown here between the South, the West kind of just trailing and falling down below the Midwest even, and the Northeast just basically being on the floor by comparison. Comparison. Total migration for the South was 868,000. And again, this chart you can see on the screen kind of goes back all the way to 1994. You see that the South usually is riding a little bit higher in terms of volume. Notice the red and the blue lines. Interesting, they're red. The line is red and this line is blue. Hmm, it's interesting. But you can see the departure between those two are absolutely stark. The biggest losers, New York and California. So people were fleeing New York and California while Florida and Texas really took off. You can kind of imagine all the things surrounding that. I don't want to get to... I'll let all the viewers out there speculate as to what is leading to all this migration change. I think there's probably a lot of factors involved. But as far as the interest rates are concerned, I got to tell you, this is probably one of the major drivers of the future of 2023. A lot of folks are already asking, hey, Jared, what do you think is going on in the real estate market? There are two major, major players in how poorly or how well we are going to see the market do next year. And that's going to be interest rates and recession. Right now, you can see that in the middle of November, interest rates tipped and brought the inventory levels actually down in a lot of states that were struggling. I'll show you this right here. In the month of December, you're looking at a graph of the areas and metro markets with the largest inventory decreases. Now, I'm going to bring it up particularly here because look at the ones that actually finally experienced some softening. I say finally because San Jose, San Francisco, New York. New York's actually been doing pretty well. But I will say a lot of these California markets, Boise, Idaho, up here these markets have been making a lot of news lately because the inventory is piling on so the fact that we saw these particular markets here at the forefront of seeing their inventory shift in the month of december is a very good thing shows a couple things more than likely there's gonna be a lot of folks who just pulled their house off the market for christmas but there's also a factor that with the interest rates that you just saw speeding up you had a situation where people in these marketplaces got back in the game and decided to get in the market now this is a good thing because if you look behind the numbers, particularly in Florida, there's a great website which I wish they would bring more current data called How Money Walks. It actually shows you that in the particularly the Florida markets, a lot of our inbound migration is from Chicago, Illinois, Cook County, and it's from New York. So the more of these folks can get their house out there, get it off the market, get it sold, that's money that's moving south, folks. If money can move south, we know where the money's coming from, California and New York, people are fleeing those states. And all of you in New York and California, you don't have to be too concerned because your marketplaces are so constrained with supply. You know, there's a lot of times it's hard to find a house in those areas because metropolitan areas, they don't have a lot of supply. They actually don't have a lot of affordable supply is a really big problem. Now on the opposite in the spectrum, you see a lot of Florida markets that really didn't see a big shift. You know, the marketplaces I just went over are feeder markets where the equity comes from. Those marketplaces tend to come into Florida and say, wow, Florida, you're so cheap. I can't believe you can buy this house for five or $600,000. So now you see at the top of the list, Miami, Florida ranked the list on multiple marketplaces here. One, two, and number five, all the counties from Miami were the lowest changers. Now, why? Because Miami has the lowest inventory in the country historically. 
Miami never had a spring back. When the interest rates climbed last year, Miami never suffered. They didn't change. You know, so all these other marketplaces that were going 100 miles an hour and then just hit the brakes in May and then June. And, but you can see uh, Orlando's number seven on the list of unchanged inventory. Just did not see a decrease. Tampa, Florida's number 11. And I'm surprised Lakeland is not making the list uh, because Lakeland is absolutely seeing a shift in it. Lakeland, by the way, if you're watching this from outside the state of Florida, is a marketplace halfway between Tampa and Orlando. Okay. So uh, Lakeland has become this uh, outskirts town that's starting to see a lot of action, people moving there. And as a result, uh, that particular marketplace, it, it got bid up. People were, were stopping. Like, oh, I can get to Tampa in 45 minutes. I can get to Orlando in 45, 50 minutes. I want to buy here. And Lakeland's inventory has gone up quite a bit compared to all the other Florida markets. So that's going to be one to watch in the area that's going to be kind of sketchy and concerning because as a whole, Florida is not really seeing their inventory just shoot up. But that one's gone up quite a bit. I'm going to do a play by play really quick just over the Orlando marketplace to give you an idea of how things are going in about a 60 second span time. Check this out. Days on market. This is a three year graph. You can see days on market were pretty high, averaging around 106 days was kind of like what you could call typical a couple years back. It absolutely slumped and now we are on our way back up. So you're actually seeing the marketplace return to those 105, 106 day averages and it has done so much over the past seven months. Average sold to ask. This is the percentage that a seller gets off of their asking price. You can see it was buckling up here at over 100%. Most sellers got at least full price, if not a little more. In April, May, you had over 100% average. You can see that's constantly drifted down. It's now back to about 97.17%, which is kind of like the common average probably anywhere throughout the US. Um, that's a very common number. Most people would negotiate down 3%. Units sold, tanking. Amount of homes being turned over, way, way down. Some of the lowest numbers we've seen, I think actually last uh, November was the lowest number that we have on record in three years. Maybe I should take this graph out further and, and see, see just how far back that goes. But you can see the average price of homes sold. It's just been a steady climb. We're now hovering at 49% after some value was lost. May, June, it peaked. I'd say I'd argue May was really the end. People that went under contract in May was the last 425, 428. And now it's kind of settled ever since. Right now the average is 405,000. So it's actually kind of like petered out. So if you if you look, you know, it was caving down pretty quickly going into November, but the interest rates kind of shifted. There's been somewhat of a comfort level back in the market. People are starting to look again. But I gotta tell you, there's a lot of homes in the marketplace just are not worth talking about. You can look through the low inventory and see just a lot of people that have they put a house in the market it's not ready it doesn't look right they're never reducing the price the price stays high you know on the whole the the inventory that's there is just very slim new construction is a good opportunity these days if you really want to buy you don't want to rent uh there's a lot of opportunity to buy your interest rate down get your rate down while you're waiting for the the total rate situation to correct itself out. General theory, conventional wisdom is that if interest rates come under control, that you're going to see the housing market kind of come back to where it needs to be. Really, the recession is going to be the game changer this year. Let's take a quick look at Tampa. Tampa across the prior years, you can see that you have 2022 is the black line. You have the prior year orange 2021 followed by 2020, 2019. You can see that new listings on the floor, just like all the other markets, whenever new listings are trailing, then pendings are trailing. There's less properties to put in a contract. Homes sold is going to be trailing. You know, you kind of see some of this falling for eight months straight. It's kind of coming back a little bit, but it's still really at, you know, multi-year lows. Again, in Tampa, you can see price drops, the amount of people reducing home prices just to get their home out there and off the market, climb to multi-year highs, still kind of hanging up there, probably 25%, 30%. I'd look closely at that graph, but you have the months of supply. This is that absorption rate that I like to watch. This is how many months of inventory you have. As this graph climbs is an indicator of all the buyers that really kind of backed out of the area. Tampa still sitting on a multi-year high on this particular graph, but you're noticing Noticing that it looks like a lot of these metro areas you're going to see, they really mimic and mirror one another. Ultimately, too, all of these marketplaces, none of them are, are very high on inventory. So Tampa and Orlando look very similar in terms of how much inventory they have, there, but they're just not. I'm not saying the market's massively on fire, but I'm saying there's just not a lot of inventory. Next up, we're looking at Jacksonville. Jacksonville is a four-year high months of supply. So inventory there is back up. 
Uh, let's take a look at new listings in Jacksonville. Jacksonville, again, multi-year, looks almost identical to Tampa in terms of it just being on the floor with listings hitting the market. Obviously, pending home sales are off. Every market, you're gonna see the same. New listings down, pending sales down, homes sold down, and then months of supply being on the upper end as we saw a second ago. It went from being a four-year low back in early 2022 to now being a multi-year high. And again, it's not really way out of the ballpark. Let's stroll through Miami. One of the interesting things about Miami, it's actually probably one of the most sustained hot markets in the Florida market, which faring on their own, but you can see new listings are off, you know, again, on the floor, like the rest of the markets, pending sales are down, homes sold are down, and you got months of supply actually came just inside of 2019. So this is the first of the three markets we've looked at that actually doesn't have a month of supply that exceeds all prior years. Miami, arguably, again, one of the better marketplaces. If you look at their listing numbers, they are on the floor. I mean, as a percentage, I mean, a lot of these marketplaces, if you look at Tampa, you look at Orlando, we're at like 50, 60% active supply. It means the amount of homes we have to pick from are roughly 50, 60% of its normal cycle. Okay, so if we usually run 100 listings, we're running at 50 to 60 listings still. Let's talk about some of the marketplace news. You, you had this, this particular article come out from a, a reporter on Channel 2, which is a local uh, Orlando report, talking about affordability issues. I want to read some of this. A guy named Ken Johnson, who is an economist from FAU, was cited in this article, brings up some good points, some things I actually want to call attention to. So when we last spoke to the housing experts, they told us demand decreased, but home prices are not expected to go down. Particularly when you're talking about demand decreasing, the number one metric you want to watch is called months of supply. Months of supply is a rate of absorption. Of how, Based on how fast homes are selling right now, how long would it take for us to sell all the homes in the marketplace? If that number goes really, really high, that means that of the homes that are there for sale, the, the activity of them being bought is going so low on a monthly basis, homes are getting older in the market. Days on market time are going up. Age of inventory is going up. So month of supply is actually one of the major health indicators you will be watching in your marketplace or anywhere else. You can see here on Miami, Miami was running on the floor and it went up a bit, but then it's kind of like, cratered and corrected. So you can see Orlando, much like the other marketplace, again, these year, these are years of time. So you have uh, 2019, 2020, 2021. At the end of 2022, you can see instead of year after year, it just got hotter and hotter and hotter and to the floor. It just, the amount of time it would take to sell a house was like, it's instantly, there's no inventory. You had this line market by market, just kind of constantly kind of climbing. The good news is, particularly in Orlando, as it climbed up till about October going in November, that trend started to fall. Now, the interesting part about all of Florida's marketplaces right now is the absorption rates, they've been climbing, yet we do not have high supply in Florida. That is the weirdest thing. Like right here is a Fred graph. This right here is Federal Reserve data. This particular graph shows you all of the active inventories in the state of Florida. This particular graph shows that Florida usually hovers around 135, 140,000 listings on a normal basis. It plummeted down to like 35,000. So it was super low. And, and right now, inventory has risen almost 300% off the bottom. So it's now right around 90,000 when it was hovering around 33, 35,000. March, April of this year was, was when it really bottomed out. But you got to understand this particular point, 89,000 homes, is still quite a ways beneath our average. When you're looking at this graph, you know, one of the interesting things when you look at the news and people are saying, you know, we don't expect home prices to go down. The reality is a lot of that particular data is people are hanging their hats on the fact there's nothing, the you know, inventory is low and inventory is low in certain states. Okay. When you look at inventory levels, you really want to look at how they have been in history. What is your state look like right now? What is your, your marketplace look like right now in relation to four years ago? or maybe five years ago. You look at long historic trends. If your marketplace still is very low on inventory, there's a better chance that even with lower demand, your prices will have a better chance of holding. Florida obviously has the benefit of a lot of headwinds, which we just talked about. That obviously keeps the demand pedal down. However, even in Florida, you noticed from the Redfin graphs that we still had months of supply. This is what's incredible. This months of supply graph has gone well higher of over prior years. The thing is, usually you have mounting supply. So if months of supply is going up, what's happening? Well, supplies 
filling up. A lot of people are listing homes and then months of supply goes up. Well, what's interesting about this market is months of supply is going up despite record low levels of people putting houses on the market. The volume of buyer activity is so poor right now. It's so pathetically weak, the buyer energy into the market that even with a trickling of new listings, months of supply is getting higher and higher because the buyers are just not absorbing the homes. Let me show you case in point. I'm gonna look actually at Aura's uh, specific data points here. The association in Orlando, if you look at market after market, you're gonna see very much common trends here. But take a look at this. Inventory back in May, okay? May 22 was really where the, uh, the, the Apple cart tipped over for everybody. I mean, interest rates got so untenable you had inventory at 3,851 total homes. You had new listings coming in at 4,800, but let's look at it today. Okay. So this is a November chart. Let me scroll right back up to the top. This is the most recent month I have data for. Now I am shooting this in the beginning of 2023. However, December's data is not down yet, but let me show you what's going on in our marketplace. Look at this 7,197 homes on the market. It is a 136% increase yet. Look at new listings. New listings are down 20% yet inventory is up. 136% over a uh, November a year ago. Take a look at this. Look at look at closed sales. This is incredibly low. The Aura board reported closed sales. 1996 sales for all of Aura. Okay, that is nothing, folks. If you go back a year ago, 3664 homes, that's a 45% decline. Now, over prior month, November of this year, 19 um, just under 2000 homes closed, that represents a 26 and a half, almost 27% drop over October October a month prior. And again, take a look at some of the pricing information. So just back in May of this year, look at the average price in the, in the Aura area. Aura being Orlando Realtors Board for this metro area. $445,500 average price point just this past May, a $370,000, right at $380,000 median price. Take a look what it is now. 324,483 and the median price down from 380 is now at 360. That's a 12% change. Still still again trending over last year. And you're like, "Wow, Jared, you're still up 12%." Yes, but that gap has been closing consistently. The month prior in October, the average price was 435,000. It fell to 424. 2.5% price loss on average price and then median price was a 1.4% change. And we're seeing this a lot. So when you're actually looking at the Orlando board data, you're seeing these month over month changes kind of taking place. But let's jump back into this article, okay? Other affordability issues from inflation to fears of recession are expected to keep many prospective buyers sidelined. The state is evolving. Now this is from an economist. The state is evolving and the robustness of our economy. I think we'll see fewer retirees. It's just too expensive. You can't retire comfortably in Orlando, Tampa, Southeast Florida, or Southwest Florida is just no longer feasible. So I have some mixed thoughts on this particular point. Um, one of the things that the economist might not be considering is the fact that how much of our retirement community is uh, coming from much wealthier states. So a lot of our attraction, Florida's attraction has really always been real estate arbitrage. It's like I can sell something of higher value up north, get to a warmer client and possibly buy something cheaper. However, he's not all wrong because if you take a look at some of our active adult communities, which are where people want to move to, you're going to see that prices in the past three years went way too hot. This is a graph of a sub major active adult subdivision in the area called Kings Ridge. Now, I didn't look at all the active adult communities, folks. I just pulled one. Now, the reason I pulled this one is because it's a popular one. It has a lot of turnover, so it can give us a pretty good idea of some of the things that might be happening in age restricted communities. And for those that don't know, active adult is a way of describing 55 plus communities that have age limits that are really catered towards retirement. So these are retirement buying homeowners. Look at this. This is a three-year graph of Kings Ridge in the city of Claremont. The place is big. I mean, this thing takes up multiple city blocks in that area. It's a very good sample size. Take a look at this though. All the sales there in three years, you can obviously from the graph, like, wow, that's spiking up. But it's in result, it's it's up in the 400s, low to mid 400s. 437 was November of 2022, the last month we have data for. January of 2020, just before COVID, the average price of a home selling there was $227,000, representing a 
20% price increase. I mean, that is insane. Obviously, you know, one of the things I got to tell you, like I could pull Claremont up, but the area around it, there is no way in that amount of time they have seen that increase in homes. Okay, look at, look, okay, so this is it. Three year trend overlay the same amount of time, 46%. The entire area around Kings Ridge only grew approximately half. I mean, how does that happen? Double, it doubled the rate of appreciation of the regular single family community around it, okay? You know, when we kind of look at these particular details, it does lend some input that there might be some sticker shock in the retirement community coming into Florida, okay? Will that hold? You know, it also makes the argument of how much, you know, certain buying groups that's a different buying block. A lot of those folks came in. Most people buying a home in their retirement are looking to move property from one to the next. So, you know, that particular group just went bonkers with bidding up houses, obviously. You know, when you see things like that, there are a few marketplaces in Central Florida that are cause for concern. Davenport's another one. If you're buying there, get a value. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy there. I'm not saying you shouldn't purchase there. I've got a client buying there right now. They did phenomenal. They bought a house now that I think is probably thirty to forty thousand dollars below. You know, the thing is, get them right, buy them right. And that's the the input that I would always give any buyer. I'm particularly very wary of certain marketplaces that have that kind of price jump in such a short amount of time. It's not normal. It can't last. Again, to this article, it says, but many agree mortgage rates will likely stay between 6 and 7% through the beginning of next year and decrease later. I have polled a few top agents, lenders, I should say, in my marketplace, and they think that people in their industry is telling them a very good chance we're going to be in a 5% interest rate range as early as March. If that happens, folks, I still think Florida is going to have, if if it's going to have a little bit of an off ramp, I think it's going to be case by case. If I say, say off ramp, I mean price corrections, things of that nature, case by case. I think there is a good chance over 18 months that we will see a shifting market. I will tell you, I've been telling this for a long time, that any of these marketplaces that are plus 70% in, in under three years, average price of the homes selling in those areas grew more than 70%, that there is a good chance you're going to see short sales or upside down properties hitting the market as early as late summer this year, fall going into winter this year into next. People that bought at the tipping point who didn't put a lot of money down. There's a lot of different creative products that are already back in the marketplace, 100% down financing through down payment programs, the subprime borrowing, the adjustable rate mortgages started to grow again last year. Properties are gonna have things like, you know, their, their rates end up maturing and now the interest rate adjusts to a higher rate because the interest rates are not low enough. You have situations where those adjustable rate mortgages could possibly become a problem, but you also have the situation where people that need to sell those houses coming back into a marketplace where those markets are going to see correction. I am telling you, if you had some bizarro, well, well above 40%. I'd say 50, 60, 50, 60% 60 growth in the last two and a half years is something to watch. But really when you start going 70, 80, 90% positive in under three years, I think the next 18 months are a watch. And I think if you're buying in those particular areas, you need to be very, very careful. The other thing is if you're flipping houses in these particular areas, you have to leave three, 4% in your numbers to be wrong. And for goodness sake, you cannot be wrong on your repair cost. If you are an investor in these particular markets, some of the things I would tell you to do is make sure you triple check your numbers. So you have to leave one to 5%, depending on where you're at, leave yourself some margin for error. Again, we'll have to wait and see, will recession really sink its teeth in and cause the housing market trouble? So that's it for now, friends. Thanks for watching. If you like the content, please give it a thumbs up. If you don't like it, give it a thumbs up. And also, Give us a comment below. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the market. What do you think's ahead for the year? Where do you think the Fed's gonna leave interest rates? What do you think the biggest factors in housing will be as it relates to this year ahead? What do we need to know? We'll talk to you guys real soon.